Welcome back to my channel, this is DailyNDU, and as I have highlighted time and time again, Canada is a democracy. No way. Really? Wait, what? We have a House of Commons and a Senate, which consists of elected members of Parliament and appointed senators. Since the House of Commons is elected and has the cabinet sitting there along with the Prime Minister, and they actually make laws and debate them and pass them, we tend to care about them a lot more. The party with the most members in the House forms the government, and their leader is the Prime Minister. Now I could make a video that goes all into everything the MPs do and their jobs, but I thought that would be somewhat boring and not as informative or entertaining. So today, I will be joined by Federal Member of Parliament Kelly Block, who has represented Saskatchewan as an MP since 2008, and currently serves as MP for Carlton Trail Eagle Creek and as Shadow Minister for Public Services and Procurement. Welcome back to my YouTube channel, and today I'm very honoured to be joined by Member of Parliament Kelly Block, who has represented the riding of Carleton Trail Eagle Creek since 2015, but been a Saskatchewan MP since 2008, if I'm correct. That <laughs> is correct. Like, would you like to introduce yourself to my audience before I begin? Sure. My name is Kelly Block. As Dylan has mentioned, I am the Member of Parliament for Carleton Trail Eagle Creek have been honored uh, to, to be in that position since 2015. I've been a member of parliament. I'm in my 16th year as a member of parliament, first being elected in 2008. Um, first and foremost, though, I am a wife and a mother and a nana to 11 beautiful grandchildren. Wow. That's awesome. Well, let's just get right into it. So you said that you've been serving 16 years now how did that nomination like how does how obviously varies between parties and it's probably changed but how did that nomination work for you and what was your road to becoming a member of parliament sure so maybe i'll start with the last question first um and you know i've been asked this question many many times and my my somewhat cheeky answer is i was asked and i said yes um, but obviously, prior to being asked, I, I was involved in other things, which I think would have caused individuals to approach me and ask me to consider running um, as a candidate for the Conservative Party of Canada. And I liken it unto um, a story that my father-in-law told me once. My father-in-law was the founder of an amazing ministry up in northern Saskatchewan. It's Camp Oshkiri on Jeanette Lake. And uh, he was a uh, founding member of that ministry. And someone once asked him, did you, did you always plan to build a camp? And he said, no, I said yes to, to teaching canoeing. And so it, it often starts small, right? You don't maybe know what the end a result is going to be from saying yes to an invitation to either be involved in your community or to volunteer on a board. But that's exactly how it started for me. I said yes to serving on a committee um, for a community project in the city of Warman years ago. And that sort of launched me into um, serving in other ways. And uh, I, I'll leave it there. That's maybe a, a, a bit of a longer story and just how I, how I decided to run. But certainly, once you make that decision to run, you have to win a nomination. And a nomination is an election that's internal to the political party. As you've said, parties conduct nominations differently. But I think um, first and foremost, for the Conservative Party of Canada, you have to um, be a member of the party in order to be eligible to run. And uh, in order to vote for a candidate in a nomination, you um, must be a member of the party. Candidates, uh, once they are approved as a candidate, they then go on to sell memberships to all of the members uh, or, or people who live in the riding. So you can start approaching people who may not be a member of the party. And that's how you begin to build um, a list of members who are supportive of you. And of course, it's really important that once you've sold those memberships, you get people out to the nomination meeting, which is set 
by the, the party together with the Electoral District Association. So every, every party has an Electoral District Association whose responsibilities are to raise money uh, for a war chest, to choose a candidate, and then, and then help to get that candidate elected as uh, the member of parliament. And oftentimes the criteria for that is established, the, the criteria for the nomination is established together uh, uh, between the party and the electoral district association. Uh, obviously there's some research that they do once someone has expressed interest to run for the party. Um, so we're vetted by the party uh, and by the EDA to, to make sure that we're a candidate um, that they would be proud to have running for their party. Yeah, thank you very, very much for that very well thought out answer. Now, obviously you're a member of parliament and you're talking to me right now, but what does the average day in the life look like for a member of parliament? That's a good question. I would, I like to describe my work um, that falls under four areas that I call the four C's. And I didn't come up with that. I, I think someone once mentioned that to me. So there's work that we do in the chamber. There's work that we do on committees. There's work that we do in caucus. And then there is work that we do in our constituency. So today I'm doing this interview with you during a constituency week or a riding week. So I'm here in the riding in my office in Martinsville. So if I, if I go back to those four C's, the chamber, um, first and foremost, a member of parliament is a legislator. So we are elected to the House of Commons to debate and vote on legislation before the House. We serve House duty one day a week, and this is to ensure we maintain quorum in the House of Commons. It's actually the responsibility of the governing party to maintain quorum, but there are certain procedures in the House where we would need to have, um, I think it's five or 15 members and it's called stand five or stand 15 in order to prevent the government from doing something. So that's why we're there and we have a certain number of people that are on house duty every day representing our party. And as I said, this is to really prevent the liberals from um, pulling any procedural tricks. And um, part of the, the chamber work is also that it's mandatory to attend question period every day. When it comes to committees, um, that is also part of our legislative duties. We all serve on standing committees of the House of Commons. There are also special committees that are struck every once in a while. Our standing committees meet twice a week. And I currently serve as the Shadow Minister for Public Services and Procurement. And so I'm on the Government Operations Committee. That leads really well into caucus, the work I do as a member of our Conservative Caucus. Um, there are me weekly meetings that caucuses hold. All parties hold their caucus meetings on Wednesday mornings. And we also hold regional caucus meetings. So all of the members of parliament in Saskatchewan are Conservative members of parliament. So right now we have um, 14 members of parliament out of 14 attending our regional caucus meetings. And senators are also welcome to attend those meetings um, they are somewhat mandatory as well. And then part of my work as, as a member of caucus is that I was appointed by the current leader to serve in his shadow cabinet, as I mentioned. And then finally, there's constituency. And uh, that uh, is where we do our constituency work. I have three offices in the riding um, and I have very capable staff. So our time is split between Ottawa and the riding. And as I said, I have three offices in the riding and one in Ottawa and I employ six people and they help me in doing all of the work that I'm doing, whether I'm in Ottawa or here in the riding. There are also extracurricular activities that parliamentarians can be involved in. There are parliamentary caucuses. So there, I'm just gonna pull an example. Um, so there's the parliamentary steel caucus the Parliamentary Auto Caucus, the Co Parliamentary Trucking Caucus. So there are different caucuses. And then there are parliamentary associations, which are more formal than the caucuses. 
as well as friendship groups. And I belong to a number of parliamentary associations and friendship groups, as well as some parliamentary caucuses. And then obviously there is there are always a lot of organizations and lobbyists that want to present um, their concerns or educate us about the industries that they um, work in or, or are representing and lots of receptions to attend as well. So our days start early and end late. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I started your day a little earlier today, didn't I? Oh, that's okay, that's okay. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for that. And what does, so obviously I followed you and you were proposing the freedom of conscious private members bill. How does the average member of parliament propose a bill and what is the process for it to become like for my, what is the process for a lot to go from being an idea to actually being a law? Sure. Those are really great questions. So. Any member of parliament who is not part of the cabinet or a parliamentary secretary has an opportunity to introduce a private member's bill. At the beginning of a parliament, it's like a, a lottery. They, they draw your name out of a hat, so to speak, and that's then called the order of precedence. So while there are 338 members, there aren't that many on the order of precedence. And um, they, are, they are put forward in allotments of 15 um, members of parliament. So at the beginning of, of a parliament, the first 15 will be put on the, um, on the order paper. Uh, the House of Commons has a set schedule that it follows every week that it sits. So most of the time in the chamber is dedicated to debating bills that the government has introduced a minister, for example, and then one hour at the end of each day is dedicated to debating private members bills. So that's not a lot of time. Private members bills essentially get two hours of debate in the House, and then they are um, referred to the committee, to the committee that they fall under for any kind of review. Um, both government bills and private members bills follow the same process of that voting at second reading, study at committee, where there may be amendments made or suggested by the committee, and then there's voting again that happens. And if it passes through the House of Commons, it will go through a similar process in the Senate. So um, quite honestly, it could take easily up to a year for a private member's bill to be passed, or if it, if it fails at second reading, then it's done. If it doesn't pass at second reading, then it would just die. Like, oh, your, go private, ahead. like your private member's bill, since you are a opposition MP, that failed at second reading, sadly, correctly? You're absolutely right, it did. Okay, anyway, it continues. Sorry for that interruption. Okay, um, so the second question about the process, how something goes from an idea to um, being introduced as, as a bill and then getting voted on. Um, obviously, ideas can come from many different places. Many MPs, when they're elected, have a, have a certain passion or focus that actually got them interested in serving as a member of parliament. So sometimes those issues that, that got them here are things that they might want to um, put forward legislation to see changes or to have the House address them. Um, you know, I guess sometimes they have, as I've said, pet projects uh, that they are very interested in, and that can be the, the basis of a private member's bill. Others are developed through our work as parliamentarians, perhaps meeting with different stakeholders who, um, who raise the opportunity to introduce a private member's bill. And then some of those things that we're all quite passionate about, as I mentioned before, I, um, I had an opportunity when we were, we were in government to introduce a private member's bill um, that died on the order paper because we went to an election. So it had passed at second reading, died on the order paper when we went to an election, but the government at the day, which was a conservative government, um, put it in our platform, put it in our speech from the throne, and it eventually became, and introduced it as a government bill. 
So there are many um, opportunities for us to, you know, to, uh, to get some of our ideas put forward, even, even if it's not through a private member's bill, through our conversations with our colleagues. And um, as I said before, um, it can take roughly a year from when it's uh, introduced in the House and uh, first debated to when it is passed in the Senate. Although sometimes private members' bills can be fast-tracked. So if all parties agree to give unanimous consent to um, passing a bill at all stages and, and sending it off to the Senate, that can happen too. So that's that's basically basically how a private member's bill works. So you've already kind of touched on this question, but I think further elaboration would be nice. Could you elaborate on the role of parliamentary committees? Like who gets to serve on them? What do they do? And like, yeah, basically that. Because I'm aware that we actually got rescheduled one at the time since you were test or you were involved in the Arrive Can hearings. So yes. Yes, so um, parliamentary committees, we're often told, are the masters of our own destiny. Um, so, you know, ideas for studies within a parliamentary committee are put forward um, by members on that committee. So I'll back up and say all members of parliament, other than members of cabinet or leadership teams, um, would be serving on committees. Some members serve on more than one. I happen to only serve on one committee. Um, uh, primarily parliamentary committees review proposed bills that have been introduced in the House, as I've said, once they are um, debated at second reading, if they pass, then they are referred to committee. And that's, primar that's a primary responsibility of a standing committee. Um, and as I've said, if individual members have ideas for a committee study, or maybe there's an issue in the news that they think it would warrant a study by a committee, they can bring that forward. And um, all members have an opportunity to talk about the agenda for the committee. However, legislation does take precedence. So when a bill is referred to a committee from the House after second reading, we have to, we have to um, put that on our agenda as a committee first. Um, and that really involves whether it's a study or the review of a bill, committees will invite witnesses to attend, to hear from them on their, to hear their views on the proposed legislation or issue to outline what their concerns might be or why they support it. And right now, um, there are basically 12 MPs on most committees, those would be committees that are chaired by the governing members. And then there are um, four committees that are chaired by opposition members, and those have 11 members on them. And the makeup on committees is, a, is very much uh, dependent on the seats in the House. So the committee I sit on right now, we have five um, Liberal members on the committee. We have for, for um, conservative members with a conservative chair. So three members on at the table, the chair is a conservative. And then there's one NDP member and one block member. And most committees uh, follow that pattern. To be, to be, to clarify, the members of not recognized parties. So like, for example, the Greens or any independents they don't get committee assignments, correct? They do, they can sit in on committees. So any member um, can sit in on a committee meeting, even if it's in camera. If you're a member of parliament, you can be in the room. You, you could even sit at the table, I believe, but you don't participate if you're not from a recognized party. Okay. Well, so, a recognized party is 12 MPs in the House of Commons, right? Yes. Okay. And on the topic of members of parliament, like debating and discussing, the big exciting thing that us political nerds like to look at is question, is like the chamber itself and its proceedings. 
So how often do you get to speak on the house floor? And how is that determined who speaks when, like that kind of stuff? Yeah, this, this really varies. Um, so there are a number of opportunities for members of parliament to speak in the house. Certainly speaking during a debate um, on a private member's bill or on a government bill, there's that opportunity. We can, if we're not speaking during the debate, but we're in the house, we have an opportunity to ask questions during the debate. Um, we have opportunities to make something called a um, SO31. So that's a statement by members, which is a, a 60 second statement that happens right at the beginning of question period. And then of course, we can ask questions during question period. Um, but who asks the questions during question period is largely determined. We have a question period coordinator and um, so they are responsible to determine who asks questions during question period. And it's based on what are the what are the prevalent issues of that day or of the week. So we, we're trying to stay um, on on top of the things that are that are you know um, emerging either in the news or in committee or that sort of a thing. If I would count all of the interventions that I, I have made, if I averaged them out, I would probably speak on the floor once or twice a week. Um, some MPs speak quite a bit less, some speak way more than that. And I guess it often depends, as I've said, what the issues of the day are and the, the bills that are up for debate. Can you talk about question, like elaborate a little more on question period? Like what happens in question period and like what happens in question period and like how's it structured and that kind of stuff? Sure. Because we're all used I... to like seeing Pierre and Trudeau yelling at each other on <laughs> the news and stuff. And recently the wacko question period. Yeah. So if you could elaborate, like how is that structured? I can. And and to be fair to to both of those individuals. They often aren't yelling. They're just making their points really well, right? Um, but so there is, uh, there's something called an order paper. And every day, the agenda for the day is on that order paper. And uh, it is very structured. The What happens in the chamber is very structured according to the order paper. Question period is very structured. Um, so oftentimes uh, in question period, well, always in question period, each day the Speaker of the House of Commons has a list of the order of who will be asking questions of the government. And that list rarely changes. It often starts with, you know, the leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition getting the first five questions, then the next, uh, the next, I think it's three questions go to the um, second opposition party. And then there's two questions that go to the third opposition party. And those first, I would say, 10 questions are asked by the leaders of the leader. And so there are no surprises. Um, it would be a surprise, what, what is perhaps a surprise and maybe not for the, for the members of uh, cabinet, they don't know what questions are going to be asked, but they know who's going to be asking the questions because that, you know, that order of questioning never changes. Um, the only time it varies is on Wednesdays when the, the leader of His Majesty's Oil Opposition will ask all the questions and the Prime Minister will answer all the questions. And that's something that shifted after 2015, um, but it is uh, consistent with what happens in Westminster in the UK. Wednesdays were, I think, are the Prime Minister's question period. And so we've adopted that over the last number of years. The questions, as I said, are divided proportionally among opposition parties so that every party has their fair share of questions to ask. Um, and then ruling party MPs 
and independent MPs get a very small number of questions to ask during question periods. Oftentimes the governing members that are asking questions are asking very softball questions of their ministers. And then there's the independents who I think maybe have, maybe only have one question at the end of question period, or maybe there's two, I'm, I'm not remembering, but very few questions by the independent members in the House of Commons as well. Just finish up by letting you know that um, there are rules uh, about the types of questions that we're allowed to ask. They, they are to pertain to the administration of the federal government. And so questions outside of that purview could definitely be ruled out of order. So sometimes you have members ask questions about something a provincial government is doing. And sometimes those could be ruled out of order because, you know, they're not, they don't fall under the purview of the federal government. Um, the government is not bound. So members, cabinet ministers are not bound by any rule, which forces them to answer a question that's been asked. Um, and of course, the old joke is that that is why it's called question period, not answer period. And uh, another rule is that we're not allowed to use unparliamentary language. For example, calling another MP a liar. And you referenced um, something that uh, was said in the House not so long ago, the word wacko. Um, I would say that the rule about unparliamentary language does sometimes get broken, um, specifically when, when it is in reference to calling into question someone's character or accusing them of lying. But I would have to say with the most recent um, example that we have, I would say that um, our new speaker um, has uh, the list of what is unparliamentary language is growing under this speaker. Now I wanna talk about a minority government and to an extent a majority government's biggest fear confidence votes. Could you tell my audience a little bit about confidence votes? Like what exactly are they and what, like, what do they do and when, how often are confidence votes? Okay. Um, so in our Westminster parliamentary system, the government must have the confidence of the house in order to govern any vote that by convention, I guess, would, um, or by designation, challenges Parliament's confidence in the government is considered a confidence vote. So um, I think typically um, money bills would be seen as a confidence vote. So anything that is giving the government permission to spend money is, would be considered a confidence vote. So a vote on the budget motion is a confidence vote, a vote on a piece of legislation to implement the budget. So we're currently debating the Budget Implementation Act, the BIA, that follows the budget. So we voted on the budget, that was a confidence vote. Now we're voting on, voting on the act that's gonna implement measures in the budget, that will be a confidence vote. There, we also um, uh, vote on estimates and there are three estimates that are introduced in the House. And these are introduced um, giving the government uh, additional spending power, and those are confidence votes. So they happen more frequently than I think people realize. Additionally, opposition members can trigger a vote of non-confidence um, in the government by stating such, by stating that they are doing so in an opposition day motion. So we have a number of days in um, Parliament that we get to introduce, that we actually own the day and are debating something that we have brought forward. And if we say, oh, by the way, this is a known confidence vote, it becomes that. Mm -hmm. So a very recent example of that uh, would be the um, opposition day motion that we introduced uh, just in March, I believe, where we forced the House of Commons to vote on a non-confidence motion over the Liberal NDP coalition's carbon tax. And then, so if that would have fa failed, that would have resulted in election. 
Absolutely. And so these, you know, this is something that, you know, the government um, would be, can, would, I think anytime there's a confidence vote coming up, they would be, uh, you know, obviously very aware that it's a confidence vote and would be watching and probably working behind the scenes to, to determine, you know, what the will of the other opposition parties um, is when it comes to a non-confidence vote, because yeah, if if a non if a vote of confidence fails, that that causes part um, the government to fall, and we would be into an election. Obviously, the Conservative Party differs from a lot of the other parties, in the sense that they allow a lot more free votes. In their party, just given that the big idea of the party is that it's a big tent party with the biggest divide in my opinion being social conservatives and not social conservatives like mm -hmm. what kind of votes exactly are free votes and which aren't right so typically private members bills are gen generally free votes even in these cases though our shadow ministers that are responsible for a bill or issue will make a recommendation to the caucus in regards to whether we should be supporting a bill or not. They have done the homework, they've done the review, they have looked to find the flaws in a piece of legislation or reasons for why we would support it. In our party, issues of conscience are also free votes. And I believe, as you've noted, we are the only party that allows our members to vote um, their conscience on on their uh, gives them a free vote on on issues of conscience um, i would say though that parliamentarians have ample opportunity to share their views on any piece of legislation whether it's a private member's bill or a government bill and then exercise their right to vote even if it goes against a recommended position. And as when I say ample opportunity, there are lots of stages along the way by which caucus members are consulted, at least in our caucus. I don't know what the process is like in other caucuses, but we have a lot of opportunities to weigh in on legislation, to provide our opinions, um, and to, you know, to have an influence on, on whether or not it is something that our party should support or not. All of those things are taken into consideration. And um, um, if at the end of the day, we cannot in good conscience support a piece of legislation, a private member's bill or a piece of government legislation, that we've been re where it's been recommended that we support it, um, we still have the opportunity to vote the way we choose to because that's our right. But it is it is um, the expectation, and I think rightly so, that we would advise our whip on how we plan to vote. If we're planning to vote against a recommended position, we need to let um, our our party whip know so that there are no surprises when it comes to standing up in the house and voting and what kind of how does the voting actually work like i know when like we're all i feel like our media is very americanized like we see how stuff works in america even if we don't care how do, like how do mps actually vote like do they like you have trump like i know everything changed after covid but like how do you right. actually cast their votes? So we do a standing vote in, in the chamber. So bells ring for a half an hour prior to a vote being called. We all head to the chamber to vote and then we do a standing vote. So it's in real time, they call, they're calling our names and we're standing to vote uh, yay or nay. Of course, they'll, they'll ask the question, the speaker asks the question, all those in favor will please rise. And then all those against. So there's a, a form in, in that way. Um, 
Of course, as, as you've noted, since the pandemic, we now have the ability to vote electronically. Um, we're always encouraged to be in the house to cast our vote. But, you know, for some who may have remained in the riding for whatever personal reason they have, or, you know, if, if they, um, if they can't make it to the chamber can now vote electronically. What is the role of the speaker? Like, what do, like, obviously, obviously we learned a little bit about the speaker after that incident in October, but mm -hmm. what does, what does the speaker actually do in the Westminster Canadian system? Right. So I'll, I'll start off first by saying that we elect our speakers. So they have to run in an election at the beginning of parliament. Um, obviously, it's a, a bit like first past the post. Uh, the, the individual with the, the most um, votes becomes the speaker. They are to be nonpartisan, even though they are a member of one of the sitting parties, one of the recognized parties. Um, and they basically moderate the business that is taking place um, in the chamber, it, very similar to a chairperson of a committee. They make sure that the agenda is, uh, is moving along and they will often, you know, be called to um, weigh in if someone has a point of order. They understand what the standing rules are and whether or not something that's being raised as a point of order um, actually is. So they moderate what's happening and they also rule on different procedural things that um, are happening in the house at any given time. What is a point of order? Like what, like I've seen like the question of privilege point of order, like what are those things? Yeah, so a point of order uh, to my understanding would be, um, oftentimes you'll see people standing up on a point of order because they believe um, a member has strayed away from the relevance of uh, the topic uh, that is at hand. Um, oftentimes they will stand up on a point of order if they believe something has happened during question period that was unparliamentary or that shouldn't have happened. Sometimes they'll stand up on a point of order because translation services aren't working. And then there are the quest, uh, you know, the points of privilege where members of parliament would stand and raise a question of privilege because they something has happened that has um, uh, meant that their ability to do their work as a parliamentarian has been violated. Now I haven't, now I didn't put this on my list of questions, but I feel like you'll do fine answering this. To what degree does like, having the two official languages, like does that ever cause a issue in house proceedings? Or like, how does that work then? Like. First of all, I don't know your proficiency in French, but right. how does that impact anything? I would not say that I am bilingual. When I was first elected, I did study French for the first five years that I was in Parliament. Um, I have never found it to be difficult. I think we have excellent translation services. And so I believe that, um, you know, those services allow me to speak in my first language they they allow you know someone whose first language is french to speak in that language and the inter interpretation is excellent i don't feel that i am hampered in any way by doing my work um given that we have two official languages that uh, here in canada and that we use in the house of commons okay okay, okay. Well, it's been quite an honor to it's been quite an honor to have you on my channel today, Mrs. Block. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about before I sign off? You know, I, not that I can think of at the moment. I just would uh, thank you for reaching out and giving me the opportunity to share with you from my experience what I've learned over the last number of years and, and uh, to share with you what my day looks like as a parliamentarian. And just add that I have, as most MPs do, if not all, very capable staff that help us do the work that we're doing as your representative. Mm -hmm.
Well, thank you very much for joining us today. And I'm sure my audience enjoyed this as well. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. So thank you. Yeah.